It's time once again for another edition of Digging the Details with Jim and Dean. And I'd like to introduce the Dean part of that equation, my co-host, Dean Brinkerhoff. Hey, Jim. Hey, Dean. Hope you're having a good Christmas time so far. So far, so good. Hope the same for you, man. Thank you. It's quite festive. We're about to even be more festive here in a second with uh, what we've got in store today. I'm glad to be here again with Jim Fanning, and we're going to talk about some fun Christmas traditions. Yes, and for a lot of people, this film is a Christmas tradition, and it has been for quite some time. And we're referring, of course, to Babes in Toyland. And I talked about this Walt Disney classic in a video from last year, where I shared some of the memorabilia associated with Babes in Toyland. But today we're going to talk more about the film itself and just some observations and insights we have about it as well. So this movie is regarded as Walt Disney's first live action musical. And I thought maybe I'd ask you, Dean, to tell us a little bit more about it and maybe your personal response to it. I know it's one of your favorites. Yes, it certainly is one of my favorites. Babes in Toyland was released in 1961 and features a lot of recurring Disney stars, um, such as Annette Funicello and Tommy Kirk, Ed Wynn, even Moochie, Kevin Corcoran. And they are all in their elements here. We have a lot to digest with Babes in Toyland, but I think that what I've experienced with Babes in Toyland is that it's a very unique film, a very Christmassy film. It's a musical, like you mentioned before. So it has a lot of unique elements that may or may not cohesively blend together in the same way that other Disney films do. But it, in that unique way, it stands out as a piece of art still in a way that may be a little unconventional to some. But I personally fell in love with it the first time I saw. It has several acts that deal with various parts of the story. And it's a take on Victor Herbert's wonderful Babes in Toyland musical that includes a lot of nods and references to various versions, but is its own unique Disney-fied version, ultimately. I have always felt that Annette Funicello is really the star here. Though she's done several roles for Disney in the past, she really stands out in this film as a very accomplished actress, singer, dancer, and all around um, Hollywood sweetheart, really. Her co-star Tommy Sands also gets to show off a lot of his talents and is a very good companion co-star to Annette. She and he counter lots of peril, adventure, friends, along the way. Annette Funicello starred first for the Walt Disney Studios on the Mickey Mouse Club and eventually went on to film such television shows and movies as The Shaggy Dog, The Misadventures of Merlin Jones and its sequel The Monkey's Uncle, and television shows such as The Horse Masters. She even had her own serial on the Mickey Mouse Club, Annette. It was to great acclaim. She was known as one of Hollywood's sweethearts and many Young men fell in love with her. Many young girls adored her and idolized her. And she was a very good role model for young girls at the time. And she was of Italian descent, which is pretty unique for those times. Walt Disney really looked to her as a great star in his lineup of young child stars at the time. And you could see a lot of potential in her, which eventually led to this role. And she's at her finest in Babes in Boyland. I do think it's interesting that she was the one Mouseketeer that Walt Disney himself handpicked. I mean, obviously he approved the casting of all the others, but they were cast by Bill Walsh and Jimmy Dodd and Roy Williams. They, they, they were the little team that was putting the show together with others involved too, of course. So Walt approved their choices, but he's the one that spotted Annette and said, in, in a dance recital, and said, oh, Let's let's make her a Mouseketeer. He saw her star quality, and he was very good at that, obviously, because she was instantly the overnight success of the Mickey Mouse Club. Some of the others, like Bill Walsh, didn't necessarily see that. Not that they didn't not that they thought she was untalented, but there was some charisma that Walt responded to that everybody else did too, the audience did. She started getting all kinds of fan mail. 
far, far, far out distancing the other Mouseketeers. Her star quality really always comes through. Her songs in this film are absolutely beautiful, and it's really fun to see her in some of those scenes that she gets to be a part of where she's trying to do the math. I Can't Do the Sum is one of my favorite songs from the movie where various colorful versions of Annette pop up on the screen and she's singing along with herself and harmonizing. And I know that was a fairly unique style to Annette as well that she developed with the Sherman Brothers of recording multiple versions of herself and harmonizing. It's on full display here in this film with that song and with various others. But that one in particular always sticks out in my mind. Yeah, I, I sure agree. And she really loves singing these songs, although she found them challenging. But she was a very humble person. And it's quite famous that she herself thought she could not sing. And when Walt Disney said, we're going to have you do some records, she was like, I can't sing. Why, why would you be having me do records? But she didn't recognize that talent in herself. But anyhow, apparently this was the Victor Herbert melodies that, that were adapted by George Bruns for this film. She found them quite a challenge. But I think I agree with you, Dean. She does a beautiful job. And really, every time I see the film, I like them even more. Uh, she, she did, she's, quite, she's just so lovely. And her whole... Um, like I, at the end of I Can't Do the Sum, where she's so kind of downcast and sorrowful, she's very affecting and it's very it's very sweet. Her sweetness always comes through. It's no wonder she was re regarded as something of an American sweetheart because her sweetness always comes through. And it's see, I think that's the thing. She's genuine. It's absolutely. absolute. It's not faked. Or it's not like something she puts on. It's so sincere and so genuine. And of course, Walt really prized that sort of thing. So, You bet. Yeah, she definitely was very sincere. And she was who she was on the screen. He said it. What do you think is your favorite song from Babes in Toyland, Jim? Or at least one or two of them. <laughs> well... I do have to say, and Annette does not have a very large role in this song, so <laughs> it's kind of funny that I would pick this. But if I had to say what my favorite is, it's the work song. Painting eyes on funny faces, putting on a smile or frown. Come now, there's lots of orders coming in. Children, we need 600 more of these, you know. Cutting, sewing, crossing dresses, every little dog gets one. Putting girls in all their dresses, isn't it a lot of fun? Christmas coming. Things are humming. Busy, busy. In a chasing. Hurry, hurry, hurry till we're done. Hurry, hurry, hurry till we're done. Which is the song that the toy maker and the and the kids, the babes, <laughs> sing as they're as they're trying to meet the Christmas deadline. That's what they're doing. They're helping the toy maker make the toys in time for Christmas. I've just I've just always loved it. I heard it first on Walt Disney's Merriest Songs, that co compilation album from Gulf. Edwin is it's such a great melody, first of all, and Edwin is so funny in it, and just the whole thing comes together so beautifully, and it's it's so upbeat. It just it just makes me happy to hear it. I really like the duet between her and Tommy Sands on Just a Toy. It's actually his song about her, but she sings her own verse or part of it. And it's it's really just lovely. Yeah, it's a beautiful tune. Smiling eyes, golden hair, made with such loving care. She's just a toy. What a thrill it will be when she's found neath a tree by some little girl Christmas morning. Uh, very romantic as well. Really good chemistry between the both of them, I think, in that song. Yes, and it really shows the sweet innocence of the story. Victor Herbert's original is actually an operetta. Operettas usually have a different style. They're very romanticized 
and of a heightened romantic sense. So it's it's very idealized and it's very it's usually very sweet and innocent. I think the operetta was a Christmas favorite right away because it's the kind of thing that is is fun and colorful to stage and then the audience wants something like that at Christmas time even though it may not be entirely focused on Christmas. It's a fun sweet confection that the entire family can enjoy. It was written in the early 1900s, so it, it, it purposely embraced that heightened thing where, the, where the, the hero is very heroic, the leading lady is very, very sweet, and the villain is, is very, very bad. <laughs> All those things are heightened. That's on purpose. And it, we, we can be sure that Walt Disney really enjoyed that kind of thing. I'm sure that's one reason he wanted to do this this movie. Um, he certainly had the rights to it for quite some time, and was going to do it as an animated film originally in the '50s when he had when he had some of these stars. He was looking for live action properties that they, he could put them in, and it was supposed it was supposed to be a TV show originally, supposed to be on the Disneyland TV series. But he decided, partially because of the money that was going to be spent that it would be better as a theatrical film. It seems like it started to grow and grow as time went on, as they realized, oh, this is going to be a little bit bigger than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> so certainly one aspect of the film that's so colorful and so part of the overall colorful confection we see on the screen are the costumes, which are beautiful. The costumes were designed by Bill Thomas, who was a longtime Disney staff member. He also designed the costumes for Mary Poppins and Bedknobs and Broomsticks and many other Disney films. One of the costumes that Annette wears is, is, is a wedding dress. She and Tom and her character, Mary Contrary, and Tom Tom the Piper's son get married at the end of the film. Well, Annette is wearing a beautiful, beautiful wedding dress, which is actually covered up by her winter traveling frock or outfit. <laughs> that they wear as they go off in the sleigh. So you don't get to see the wedding dress much, but it's quite beautiful. And that thought the wedding dress was so beautiful that when she did get married in real life a few years later, she asked Bill Thomas to design her wedding gown based on the one in Babes in Toyland. That's awesome. It really is a fun detail, isn't it? This ties right back into how much she really appreciated this film. And it kind of seems like she was almost like a kid in a candy store. She just loved doing it, and I think she was just amazed. None of her other Disney projects were like this. Here was a total fantasy world, a fairy tale world, a nursery rhyme world, and she seemed to really revel in everything about it, including the costumes. Yeah, something completely removed from our world, whereas, you know, in other roles, she was on a college campus or something. <laughs> Right. So I'd also like to bring up another Disney subject, Frozen. Here's the little golden book. Now, why would I be talking about Frozen when we're talking about Babes in Toyland? Well, it has to do with the costumes, because some of Anna's traveling capes have these beautiful Nordic-type designs in them. But some of them were inspired by the designs on Annette's costumes in Babes in Toyland. And Mike Giamo, who was the art director on Frozen, is a big Babes in Toyland fan, and he really loves the designs and appreciates and values them. A major Disney artist like Mike Giamo, that he would be drawing on Walt Disney's classic film, Babes in Toyland, is just, just incredible and something that I really like to celebrate. In fact, I did include that detail in the Frozen section of the Disney book talking about the designs in Frozen, which are, which are really extraordinary, thanks to that great Disney artist. Great inspiration there from a great film to another great film. <laughs> another fun thing about this Disney film is that it's literally Annette's favorite film that she ever was in. And I think that really speaks to how special it is. But you had also mentioned the rest of the cast, and there are some other extraordinary talents in it. Yeah, absolutely, Jim. There are several other wonderful leading stars in this film. The villain Barnaby is played by Ray Bolger, who is an accomplished actor and someone we may not 
immediately recognize, but certainly you've seen him before in a very major film, a little film called The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> they both played the scarecrow in that movie, and I always thought that was such a neat little film fact that I didn't realize offhand at first because he's significantly older in Babes in Toyland. But once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's certainly him. And he plays quite a different character in this one, a villainous antagonist. He certainly has a charm and an elegance in this role as well. Another one of my favorites in this film is the toy maker, who is played by Ed Wynn. He has a wonderful, hilarious comedic scene with Tommy Kirk towards the end of the film, <laughs> right before the climax, and, and throughout the end. But they have a almost vaudeville like banter routine going as Grumio, played by Tommy Kirk, comes up with all these marvelous inventions and innovations on toy making and Edwin the toy maker comes in and tells him, Oh, it's terrible but then takes the idea right away, claims it as his own. And it's it's very funny and I've always gotten a smile and a few laughs from that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very iconic scene from that film and Edwin is the master of uh, comedy, master of film, and there was a special award given to him during the making of this film that's featured in a little television special called Backstage Party, where we get to see behind the scenes of the making of this film, and we get to see some very special moments with Walt and Annette and the rest of the cast, where in in fact, they do present him with a Mouse Good Award, which was a very, very special award given to those who accomplished something very great at the Walt Disney Studios at the time. Well, to take on the Oscar Award given at the Academy Awards and just a fun little statue of Mickey Mouse. It was given to some of Walt's most accomplished stars and VIPs. Ed Wynn had been the voice of the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland. Of course, he has that very distinctive voice that lots of people imitate and have used for other characters. Then he had a cameo in The Absent-Minded Professor. The Babes in Toyland role was really Ed Wynn's first substantial live-action performance in a Disney film, and it was the first of many, because Walt was really tickled by him and started to use him more frequently, but also... It coincided with Edwin's emergence as an actor, as opposed to the comedian that he had been for decades, starting in vaudeville. For example, on TV, he was in the very heavy drama called Requiem for a Heavyweight, which I believe was written by Rod Serling of Twilight Zone fame. And out of that, he started doing dramatic performances, including The Diary of Anne Frank, for which he was nominated for an Academy Award. So, you know, the the Diary of Anne Frank is the definition of a heavy drama, for oh, sure. Yeah. And he had and he has some comedic overtones in his character, but obviously in that very stark production, it called for some real acting chops. So Edwin had really become more popular than ever in all kinds of projects and films, and and Walt reveled in using him. You had also mentioned that they gave him the mouse car on backstage party. Our audience might notice that I'm playing on the TV back here. That's one of my favorite television specials because we literally get a tour of the Disney studio lot, starting with the front gates all the way through to some of the, the sound stages and the sets. And we even get to see some of the fun um, backdrops of some of our favorite films like Toby Tyler and some of our favorite television shows like Zorro. There's some really neat things on display in that little television special, and it gives us a great sneak peek at what's to come in Babes in Toyland for those that were watching in the 1960s and awaiting Babes in Toyland to be released. One of the most unusual stars is Sylvester the Goose, who is Mother Goose's friend, and he kind of comments and has some wisecracks about the proceedings. And he's very fascinating because, again, this is regarded as an unusual Disney film, and the fact that he's a puppet makes it even more unusual. Disney didn't usually do puppets, but he's wonderful. And the way in which he appears in the film is quite unique. Some people may not be aware that the hand that supposedly belongs to Mary McCarty 
as Mother Goose that's holding Sylvester, or Silly for short, Silly Goose, <laughs> is an artificial hand. So next time you watch it, look closely and you might be able to spot it. Her real hand <laughs> is inside her costume, and Jimmy McDonald, the Disney legend, most well known for his sound effects expertise and as the man who took over the, vo the voice of Mickey Mouse from Walt Disney in, in 1948. He was a master of all trades and often involved in effects. He is actually the one manipulating the Sylvester the Goose puppet <laughs> by putting his arm up through Mary McCarty's costume <laughs> and uh, working the puppet. And another tidbit about Sylvester the Goose that is quite interesting is that his voice is provided by the director, Jack Donahue. He's definitely a wild character, and the workings of that character are very <laughs> strange and unique, but <laughs> very fun, too, with the wisecracks he brings up to the table. And he's just another part of the sort of artifice of the film. Yeah. And everything in it is... is deliberately not real it's it's supposed to be this great fantasy obviously so in a disney in a disney way so since there's a puppet naturally it has to be done in a very special disney way that isn't like anybody else's puppet certainly the climax of the film is the march of the wooden soldiers and the battle that ensues as tom leads an army of wooden soldiers to battle the wicked barnaby and foil his evil plot the scene is filmed in stop motion and was one of the first, if not the first, scene to be done and completed before the rest of the film's production continued. This sequence was spearheaded by Exitensio and Bill Justice, who were doing practically all the stop motion at the Disney studio at the time, and they were paving the way for many other effects animation like this that would be coming up in films such as Mary Poppins, where we have the bedroom cleaning scene where all kinds of stuff is happening in stop motion animated form. And it's a really great sequence that has a wonderful score. The March of the Toys is one of the most iconic musical scores of that film and carries on its legacy through um, the park at Disneyland at Christmas time, you can still see the toy soldiers marching in the Christmas parade and they're marching to the March of the Toys and it's literally from that film, something that I believe predated the film that started at Disneyland but has carried on a tradition throughout our day. But some people may not realize that that's where its origins are from but here it is, Babes in Toyland. Yeah, you're sure right about that, Dean. The Wooden soldiers from Babes in Toyland were in the Disneyland Christmas Parade for 1960. That was a full year before the film came out. And so many people see the wooden soldiers in the Disneyland Parade at Christmas time year after year, and many don't realize where those soldiers are from. But it's Babes in Toyland. And you're also certainly right about the musical piece you were talking about, The March of the Wooden Soldiers. That's the clue that really tells us that the Babes in Toyland property has always been associated with Christmas because that's always been considered a Christmas time musical piece. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the story, they're making Christmas toys. That's another reason I like, I like the work song sequence because you can see the children making the toys that later Tom, who's only this big now, is leading into battle against Barnaby. It's so cool. It's like it's so cool how that's totally set up. And some of the other little props, like those those choir members that are in front of the stained glass window, you can see them putting them together, and then you see them later in the film. Yeah, absolutely. Now, of course, stop motion was used by other producers. Rankin Bass, of course, is very famous for using stop motion in such productions as Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, they called it Animagic. But Disney, of course, has their own version of stop motion, and they had their own name for it, their own term for it, which was Animotion. Very cool. That is very cool. Something I've never really heard of before. I think that Walt Disney really was hoping for something bigger and grander than Babes in Toyland. It turned out to be critically 
But I still think that Babes in Toyland has intrinsic value as a film, and especially as a Christmas film that definitely is part of my Christmas film rotation every year. It's got a lot of heart, whimsy, and humor, and charm throughout the film, and it's got a lot of value in the actors, especially, that I love to learn more about and explore their different roles in Disney films. And I think Walt Disney really valued this film and really had a special place in his heart for Babes in Toyland and the Christmas season in general. There's a quote I love from Walt Disney where he said, one reason the Christmas season appeals to me is that it makes us suspend business as usual routine and lets our minds soar for a while. It is a time when the imagination is more sprightly than at other periods of the year. Christmas seems to release even the most solemn of us from the Scrooge realism that occasionally besets all of us. It is natural, of course, that I should think of Christmas in terms of imagination, for imagination is my business. I always love that quote because it's so true that we can get caught up in the day-to-day and be you know, critical and kind of a Scrooge-like attitude at times, but Christmas really does give us a great reset. It gives us a humbling spirit. And I think that we can definitely sense what he was trying to accomplish there in Babes in Toyland. It's a film of bringing everyone together, family, and it's a celebration. It's a party. It's having a good time with your friends and family and your loved ones. And I think that was very important to Walt Disney, and it's certainly very important to me. I'm sure it's very important to you too, Jim. (laughs) Well, like you, Dean, I love Christmas, and it's no surprise that Walt Disney loved Christmas because it does seem to sort of encompass everything that is wonderful about Disney. It's always been such a natural fit, I've thought. And Babes in Toyland is definitely part of that. It's a Christmas treat. It's a fun romp that's very colorful and fun. It's like a piece of Christmas candy or a candy cane. It's just a delightful confection that's meant to be enjoyed. For those who can watch it and appreciate it for what it is, they can truly enjoy it. If you have expectations that it's going to be something like Mary Poppins, it you know, those expectations will not be met, but it's it's not supposed to be that. Yeah. And, and I think like all good Disney productions, it's very secure in what it is. That's a very good point. And sometimes people will feel, oh, kind of, it's kind of all over the map and kind of, it has a lot of elements to it, but that's what it's meant to be. It's like an overstuffed Christmas stocking. Babes in Toyland, thankfully, is available on Blu-ray, DVD, and is available on Disney+. Plus. It's definitely in the Christmas collection but it's available year-round, too. If you're a longtime fan of the film, watch it again, because it's a treasure and one to be cherished. It certainly is a colorful treat for the eyes and a colorful treat for Christmas time or any time. So I'm very glad you pointed that out, Dean. And that brings us to the conclusion of our discussion about Babes in Toyland, although there's plenty left to say, that's for sure. So maybe we'll revisit this topic at another time. But for now, he's Dean. And he's Jim. And we'll see you soon on another edition of Digging the Details.